where colossal pyramids pierce the sky. One name stands out like a whisper in the wind. Khufu, the enigmatic pharaoh who commissioned the Great Pyramid of Giza. Cloaked in mystery and shrouded in legend, Khufu's reign is a tale of power, ambition, and the relentless pursuit of immortality. Join me as we together unravel the secrets of this ancient ruler, whose legacy looms large over the sands of time. Khufu, also known as Cheops, ruled as the second pharaoh of the fourth dynasty during the Old Kingdom period in the 26th century BC. He inherited the throne from his father, Sneferu. Khufu is most famously associated with commissioning the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. However, many details about his reign remain poorly documented. We're going to go through some of the more well-documented parts of his reign today, and perhaps also engage in some speculation. Before we continue, I'd like to remind you, if you enjoy the content, to like and subscribe, and for the algorithm, leave your comments down below. Now, back to Khufu. The primary surviving depiction of Khufu is a small ivory figurine discovered in a temple ruin at Abydos in 1903. Other representations of him, including reliefs and statues, are all but fragmentary, and many of his buildings, apart from the Great Pyramid of course, have been lost to time. Information about Khufu primarily comes from inscriptions in his necropolis at Giza, and later historical documents, such as the Westcar Papyrus from the 13th dynasty. Most writings about Khufu were penned by ancient Egyptian and Greek historians around 300 BC. At this time, the Library of Alexander was uh, really trying to improve its selection. These sources present conflicting perspectives on Khufu's character. While he enjoyed cultural recognition during the Old and New Kingdoms, Ancient historians, like Manetho, Diodorus, and Herodotus, portray him in a negative light. But we'll get to that later. Despite his enduring legacy, an enigmatic and critical portrayal of Khufu's personality persists in the historical accounts. The name Khufu, or Cheops in different rendering, is dedicated to the god Knum, suggesting a connection to divine origin and status. His full name, Knum Khufu, means Knum protect me, while modern pronunciation is Khufu. During his time, it may have been more closer to Kayafwe, and later 
kill off. He used two versions of his birth name, Knum Kuf and Kufu, the latter not emphasizing his connection to the god Knum. His Hellenized name is Cheops, that's what the Greeks call him, but he's also called Sufis and Sophie by the Greeks. Arab historians refer to him as Saurid or Salhuk. Of course, whenever we talk about an Egyptian figure of history, we have to examine his or her name. It's the best way to start. The exact length of Khufu's rule remains uncertain. Indeed, it was a rather early old kingdom ruler. Records from his later years suggest he was nearing his 30-year jubilee, perhaps possibly just missing it. A rock inscription at the Dakla Oasis mentions Khufu's name, indicating events in his 27th regnal year. Fragments of the diary of Merer found at Wadi al-Jarf detail limestone block transportation during his reign. The highest dated record associated with his funeral comes from the 28th or perhaps the 29th year of his reign. The royal canon of Turin attributes 23 years to his rule, while Herodotus and Manetho claim 50 and 63 years respectively, though the accounts of Herodotus and Manetho are generally believed to be exaggerations especially Herodotus, who seems to take great delight in exaggerating almost anything he can get. Khufu's political activities within and outside Egypt are sparsely documented. Domestically, he is mentioned in building inscriptions and statues with his name appearing in various locations, such as Wadi Hamamat, Elephantine, Hatnub, and Elkab. At Saqqara, terracotta figurines of the goddess Bastet, bearing Khufu's Horus name, have been found, dating back to his reign, but deposited during the Middle Kingdom. At Wadi Magare in the Sinai, a rock inscription portrays Khufu adorned with the double crown. That's the crown of Upper and Lower Egypt, by the way. When that indicates the sovereignty of both lands. Now don't get confused. Upper Egypt is the lower part of Egypt, at least the southern part on our modern day maps as we perceive it. And of course, Lower Egypt is the part next to the Mediterranean. The reason why this is, is because of the flow of the Nile. But I digress. Khufu organized expeditions to search for turquoise and copper mines, much like his predecessors Sekhmet, Sahure, and his father, Sneferu, who are also depicted in elaborate reliefs in the area, reflecting their pursuit of these valuable resources. Additionally, Khufu engaged in trade with Byblos, dispatching multiple expeditions to exchange copper tools and weapons for coveted Lebanon cedar wood. 
Now this wood was crucial for constructing large and sturdy funerary boats, such as those discovered at the Great Pyramid, underscoring its significance in ancient Egyptian burial practices. Recent archaeological findings at Wadi al-Jaf, an ancient port on Egypt's Red Sea coast, have unveiled new insights into Khufu's political activities. Discovered in 1823 by John Gardner Wilkinson and James Burton, the site was later rediscovered in 1954 by French scholars Francois Bisset and René Chabot Morisseau. However, it wasn't until late June 2011 that extensive excavations resumed under the leadership of French Egyptologist Pierre Talley and Gregory Marouard, organized by the French Institute of Oriental Archaeology. Among the discoveries made in 2013 were hundreds of papyrus fragments dating back four and a half thousand years. Now exhibited at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, hailed by renowned archaeologist Zahi Hawass as the greatest discovery in Egypt in the 21st century. And if you don't know who Zahi Hawass is, he is the gentleman who is the chief of Egyptian antiquities. I believe he retired from the position some years ago, but quite a renowned figure in uh, Egyptian history and archaeology. And what a job, the Minister of Antiquities for Egypt. Certainly a position coveted by many. Well, back to these papyri. With ten remarkably well-preserved examples, they predominantly date to the 27th year of Khufu's reign and detail the provision of food and supplies to sailors and wharf workers. Addressed to the king by his Horus name, they offer a rare glimpse into the administrative operations of the fourth dynasty, and believe me, you do not get many glimpses into that. Notable among them is the diary of Merer, shedding light on the daily lives of those involved in the construction of the Great Pyramid. Also discovered were the inscriptions bearing Khufu's cartouche name on limestone blocks at the site, underscoring the harbour's strategic significance. Before I move on, the word cartouche is uh, the French word for bullet. Many of the times when we see Egyptian names written, they will be written framed in a shape that looks like a bullet, which is why the French archaeologists called them so. Remember that word, cartouche. The harbour facilitated the importation of valuable materials, such as turquoise and copper, from the nearby Sinai Peninsula as indicated by storage lists in the papyri fragments. Mentions of a harbour on the opposite coast, near the fortress Tel Ras Budran, suggest the existence of an ancient sailing route across the Red Sea, possibly used for expeditions to the legendary land of Punt. These findings provide unprecedented insights 
into ancient Egyptian maritime trade networks and Khufu's political influence in the region. The sole surviving three-dimensional portrayal of Khufu, the Khufu statuette, is a meticulously restored ivory figurine depicting the king adorned with the red crown of Lower Egypt. Seated on a throne with a truncated backrest, the statue showcases Khufu holding a flail in his left hand, while his right arm rests on his upper leg. The figurine, discovered headless in 1903 by Flinders Petrie at Qom el Sudan near Abydos, underwent extensive restoration. Petrie's diligence in recovering the head, found weeks later in deeper rubble, underscored the artifact's significance. And one may imagine quite a needle in a haystack to find the little head of Khufu among all of those broken ancient rock. Currently housed in room 32 of the Egyptian Museum of Cairo under inventory number JE36143, the statuette is believed by most Egyptologists to be a temporaneous with Khufu. However, scholars like Zahi Hawass propose an alternative view, and if it's Zahi Hawass, you better listen, suggesting it may be an artistic reproduction from the 26th dynasty. Hawass argues that the absence of the 4th dynasty structures at the excavation site, coupled with the figurine's stylistic anomalies, such as Khufu's unusual facial features and the incongruent throne design, do support this interpretation. Additionally, the presence of the neck and neck flail, a ceremonial insignia not depicted until the Middle Kingdom, raises doubts about the statuette's authenticity, leading Hawass and many others to speculate it might have served as a commercial amulet rather than a genuine portrayal of Khufu. It is often claimed that the Khufu statuette is the sole surviving statue of Khufu, though this assertion is also disputed. Excavations at Saqqara in 2001 and 2003 uncovered a pair of terracotta statues portraying a lion goddess potentially Bastet or Sekhmet, with childlike kings at her feet. While the right figure bears Khufu's Horus name, the left depicts Pepi I of the Sixth Dynasty by his birth name, indicating a later addition to the statue group. This departure from the typical unity of Old Kingdom statue groups suggests a distinct restoration during the Middle Kingdom, possibly driven by a focus on the goddess rather than royal worship, as evidenced by the gypsum covering the king's names. The Palermo stone fragment C2 records the creation of two oversized standing statues for Khufu, one of copper and the other one of pure gold. Additionally, excavations by George Reisner 
at Giza yielded alabaster and travertine fragments inscribed with Khufu's full titulary, including cartouches, remember that word, the bullet, bearing his name, or Knum Kuf. Among these, a fragment of a small seated statue displays the king's legs and feet, with a visible cartouche suggesting the name Khufu. In the Romer und Palaisius Museum, Hildesham, two alabaster objects, possibly parts of a statue group akin to the triad of Mycerinus, feature the head of a cat goddess. Several statue heads, including the Brooklyn head in the Brooklyn Museum and a limestone head, in the state collection of Egyptian art in Munich, have been attributed to Khufu, based on features such as chubby cheeks and size. How cute. Khufu is depicted in various relief fragments, scattered throughout his necropolis and other locations. Crafted from finely polished limestone, these reliefs offer glimpses into different aspects of Khufu's reign. Some originate from the ruined pyramid temple and the destroyed causeway, once adorning the walls in their entirety. Others were repurposed in the pyramid necropolis of King Amenemat I at Lisht, as well as at Tanis and Bubastis. One fragment displays Khufu's cartouche alongside the phrase, Building of the Sanctuaries of the Gods. Another depicts a procession of fat oxen adorned with flowers intended as sacrifices, with inscriptions praising them as offerings for Khufu. A third fragment portrays what is believed to be the earliest depiction of royal warfare, featuring archers drawing their bows. Yet another shows Khufu wearing the double crown while impaling a hippopotamus. You perhaps may feel bad for the hippopotamus, but do remember that in Africa the hippopotamus kills more people each year than any other animal. Do correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to be quite a battle against the creature. At Wadi Magare in Sinai, a rock inscription bears Khufu's names and titles, lauding him as the great god and smiter of the troglodytes. All protection and life are with him. May I say I adore the use of the word troglodyte. The style of the relief is reminiscent of King Sneferu's works, depicting scenes of Khufu wearing different crowns and engaging in actions such as smiting enemies with accompanying deities like Toth and Wepwawet. Now, Here's an interesting thing that many archaeologists have noticed. None of the relief fragments depict Khufu making offerings to a deity. This absence is notable as reliefs of Sneferu and subsequent kings commonly feature such scenes. The omission may have contributed to later Greek historians' speculation that Khufu had closed temples 
and prohibited sacrifices. But there's that word again. Speculation. Khufu's pyramid complex stands in the northeastern part of the Giza Plateau. Some speculate that limitations such as lack of space and local loam limestone quarries, rather, along with unstable ground conditions at Dashur, prompted Khufu to choose this location, moving away from his predecessor Sneferu's pyramid. Positioned at the high end of a natural plateau, Khufu's pyramid, named Aket Khufu, meaning Horizon of Khufu, was designed to be prominently visible. The Great Pyramid has a base measuring approximately 750 by 750 feet and currently stands at a height of 455 feet. Initially, it reached a height of 481, but over time, the pyramidion and limestone casing were lost to stone robbery. Believe it or not, I wouldn't be going all the way up the top of the pyramid to be taking what was from there, but we have been told that they were covered in gold at the top, in which case it may be worth the trouble. Without its casing, the core of the pyramid is exposed, constructed in small steps using dark limestone blocks. The original casing, made of nearly white limestone, was finely polished, giving the pyramid a brilliant, luminous experience. While it's speculated that the pyramidion might have been covered in electrum, there's no archaeological evidence to support this. The inner chambers, lined with polished granite walls and ceilings, were built with some of the hardest stones available during Khufu's era. The mortar used consisted of gypsum, sand, pulverized limestone, all mixed up together with water, and was quite strong. The entrance to the pyramid is located on its northern side. Inside, three chambers are found, the king's chamber at the top, containing large granite sarcophagus, the statue chamber in the middle, often referred to as the Queen's Chamber, but its purpose remains debated, and an unfinished subterranean chamber beneath the foundation. While the burial chamber is well defined by the sarcophagus, the function of the Queen's Chamber remains uncertain, with some suggesting it housed a car statue of Khufu. The subterranean chamber, left incomplete, adds to the pyramid's enigmatic allure. The subterranean chamber within Khufu's pyramid complex appears to be the oldest of the three chambers, with evidence suggesting it was part of the original building plan, possibly intended for a simple chamber complex with multiple rooms and corridors. However, construction was halted for unknown reasons, 
and two additional chambers were built inside the pyramid. Notably, the Grand Gallery leading to the King's Chamber features a corbelled arch ceiling and serves a crucial static function, distributing the weight of the stone mass above the King's Chamber into the surrounding pyramid core. Surrounding Khufu's pyramid was an enclosure wall, with segments spaced 33 feet or 10 meters apart. On the eastern side, directly facing the pyramid, stood Khufu's mortuary temple, constructed with black basalt foundations, red granite pillars and portals, and white limestone ceiling stones. Today, only the foundation remains, with a causeway once connecting it to the Valley Temple, located 0.43 miles away. The original form and size of the Valley Temple are unknown, as not even its foundations are preserved. Adjacent to the pyramid on the eastern side lies the East Cemetery of the Khufu Necropolis, housing the mastabas of princes and princesses. Three small satellite pyramids, likely belonging to Queens Hetaferes, Meritetes I, and possibly Henutsen, were erected nearby. In 2005, the cult pyramid of Khufu was discovered close to the Queen's pyramids. On the southern side of the Great Pyramid are further mastabas and the pits of Khufu's funerary boats, while the West Cemetery on the western side contains the tombs of high officials and priests. Part of Khufu's funerary complex may include the renowned Great Sphinx of Giza, a large limestone statue depicting a recumbent lion with a human head, wearing a royal Nemes headdress. Carved directly from the Giza Plateau, the Sphinx was originally painted in vivid colors. Its builder, or sculptor rather, remains a subject of debate, with candidates including Khufu, his sons Jedfara and Kaifa. The original symbolic function of the Sphinx is also uncertain, although it likely served as a guardian of the sacred cemetery of Giza, representing the king in allegorical form. During the Old Kingdom, Khufu's mortuary cult was extensive, evidenced by the archaeological discovery of at least 67 mortuary priests and six high officials serving at the necropolis by the end of the Sixth Dynasty. Some of these priests had been serving since the late Fourth Dynasty, with a notable increase in their number during the reigns of the Fifth and sixth dynasties. This contrasts with the other rulers of the time. For instance, Khufu's stepfather, Sneferu, had fewer mortuary priesthoods, and even Jedfara and Kaifra had fewer than Khufu. 
These cults played a significant role in the state's economy, as special domains were established for offerings. However, the number of domains decreased rapidly by the end of the Sixth Dynasty, with none recorded during the Seventh. In the Middle Kingdom, a rock inscription at Wadi Hammamat, dating back to the Twelfth Dynasty, mentions Khufu alongside other rulers. While it was previously thought that rulers like Balfra and Jedhefor had brief reigns, they are now believed to have been princes. Khufu's inclusion in this list suggests that he and his followers were revered as patron saints, supported by findings such as alabaster vessels inscribed with Khufu's name at Koptos, a pilgrimage site for Wadi Hammamat travelers. The Westcar Papyrus, a literary masterpiece from the 13th dynasty, features Khufu witnessing a magical wonder and receiving a prophecy from a magician named Dedi. The depiction of Khufu in this story is complex, showing him as both ruthless and inquisitive. Some Egyptologists view Khufu's actions in the story, such as ordering a prisoner's execution to test Dedi's powers, as merciful suggesting that Khufu would have spared the prisoner if Dedi had succeeded. Others see Khufu's character as enigmatic, deliberately crafted by the author to be mysterious. This contradictory portrayal has sparked debate among historians and Egyptologists with interpretations ranging from negative to positive, influenced by ancient Greek traditions and Egyptian cultural teachings. During the New Kingdom era, Khufu's burial site and the associated religious practices underwent a kind of reorganization, with Giza becoming a significant center for both economic and religious activities once again. In the 18th dynasty, King Amenhotep II constructed a memorial temple and a royal stella near the Great Sphinx, while his successor, Tatmase IV cleared the Sphinx from sand and placed a commemorative stella, known as the Dream Still, between its paws. Although both inscriptions share similar narratives, neither provides definitive information about the true creator of the Great Sphinx. Toward the end of the 18th dynasty, a temple dedicated to the goddess Isis was constructed at the satellite pyramid G1C, associated with Queen Henetsen, within Khufu's burial complex. This temple underwent expansions during the 21st and 26th dynasties with priests serving both Isis and Khufu. A golden seal ring bearing the name of a priest named Neferibre was discovered at Giza from the 26th dynasty. During the late period, 
Numerous scarabs inscribed with Khufu's name were circulated, likely serving as talismans or symbols of luck. Over thirty of these scarabs have been preserved. Additionally, an ancestral lineage of priests of Isis, spanning from 670 to 488 BC, is depicted on a display at Isis's temple. The famous inventory stella from this period mentions Khufu and his wife Henutsen, although some modern Egyptologists speculate that by this time Khufu may have been regarded more as a symbolic ruler rather than a revered royal ancestor, particularly in the context of the Isis Temple's history. Well, there you have it. That is almost all we know about Khufu and his Great Pyramid, condensed down somewhat into this video for you. I hope you've learned something, and once again I invite you to like and subscribe to the channel, and leave your comments down below, as it certainly helps the algorithm. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a good day, and make sure that you smile. But if you don't feel like smiling, then just do whatever makes you feel comfortable. I'll see you next time. Good night, everybody.